Hi there, our valued and treasured viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa, and I am a clinical pharmacist by training and profession. I'm the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, the Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference. We are patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. We seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So I urge you to sit back and spare me a few minutes of your precious time as I share some tips with you. So welcome to part two of our pharmacotherapy MCQs. And in our first question, in a cohort study where the investigators looked at the association between smoking and throat cancer for 20 years, they found a relative risk of 14. So my question to you is, how can this data be interpreted. Does it mean 14% of the throat cancers are due to smoking? Does it mean smokers had 14% increased risk of throat cancer compared to non-smokers? Does it mean smokers had 14 times the risk of throat cancer compared to non-smokers? Or does it mean smokers had 86% increased risk of throat cancer compared to non-smokers. I'll give you 10 seconds to make a rational decision. So in my opinion, C is the correct answer. And below it, I've given you a simple explanation. So I'll give you another five seconds to read through before moving to the next slide. So in our next question, what is or are the risk factors for pseudomal pneumonia in the general population? Is it being on a mechanical ventilator for many days? Is it a 10-year history of COPD? Or is it chronic steroid use? Or is it all the above? I'll give you 10 seconds to make a choice. So the correct answer is D, all the above apply. Now the IDSA guidelines for community acquired pneumonia lists several risk factors specific for pseudomonal pneumonia, which include alcoholism, structural lung diseases such as bronchiectasis, repeated exacerbations of severe COPD, leading to frequent use of steroids and or antibiotics, being on mechanical ventilation for over three days, as well as prior antibiotic therapy. So all the three apply. So in the next question, I would like to know from you, what is or are the risk factors for MRSA pneumonia? Is it prior exposure to ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin? Is it recent influenza infection? Is it end-stage renal disease? Or is it all the three options above? I'll give you 10 seconds to make a decision.
actually d is the correct answer all the three apply the same idsa cap guideline that i referred to earlier lists the risk factors for mrsa pneumonia which include end-stage renal disease in uh, intravenous uh, injection drug use prior influenza prior antibiotic therapy especially the two fluoroquinolones cipro and levo infection with the influenza virus has also been shown to be a risk factor so let's move question PZO is a 40 year old man who was found lying on the floor with several empty liquor bottles by a friend he drank himself silly after being brought to the a and e his serum alcohol level was found to be 475 milligrams per deciliter toxicology report was negative except for high alcohol level two hours after admission in the a and e he was intubated and transferred to your icu his liver enzymes and renal function remained normal thank god now his pt and inr are still within normal limits and he has a no past medical history according to the colleague who brought him to your a and e upon transfer his medications included propofol lorazepam prn and uh, Piperacillin tazobactan was initiated by a knee-jerk reaction. So what measures can one take to prevent VAP in this particular patient? Would you opt for twice daily oral decontamination with chlorhexidine gluconate? Would you Administer piperacillin tazobactam 3.375 infused over four hours, four times daily as prophylaxis. Would you elevate the head of the bed at 30 to 45 degrees? Or is the correct answer A and C? I'll give you 10 seconds to make a rational decision. So in my opinion, A and C are the correct answers. Now the following five elements form part of the Institute of Healthcare Improvement VAP bundle. We need to give oral care with chlorhexidine gluconate. We need to elevate the head of the patient's bed at 30 to 45 degrees. The patient requires DVT prophylaxis. There is also need to do stress ulcer prophylaxis. And we need to do daily sedation assessment and spontaneous breathing trials. Those have been shown to improve clinical outcomes. The other suggested uh, measures for bar prophylaxis are small bowel feeding instead of gastric feeding now prophylactic pro probiotics can also add value and those nursing the patient should do hand hygiene using alcohol-based rubs and uh, early discontinuation of invasive devices such as cvcs if possible would add value just like early tracheostomy and uh, if we reduced reintubation rates then it would be good to go now administering prophylactic antibiotics like in option b has no place it would be a waste of resources 
So the correct answer would be D in my opinion. Let's move to the next question. Now the same patient has not changed much. Now my question to you is what vitamin should he receive to avoid the WK syndrome? I'll give you news from thiamine or B, cyanocobalamine or C, magnesium or D, folic acid. The correct answer would be A. Now, such patients require thiamine to prevent meniscus encephalopathy. So that makes A the correct answer in our case. Now, this same patient As liver functions, the liver enzymes remain normal, the renal function remains normal. Her PT and INR are within normal limits. We have no history as we saw earlier. So at this stage, what would your treatment of choice be for this acute alcohol withdrawal that is ensuing? Would it be haloperidol or would you opt for lorazepam or would you choose reprasidol or would you go for alprazolam? I'll give you 10 seconds to make a rational pharmacotherapeutic choice. In my opinion, B, which is lorazepam, is the correct choice. Now, benzodiazepams are the most studied drugs for alcohol withdrawal treatment. So, long acting ones like uh, diazepam and chlorodiazepoxide may also be used. But in this case, the only uh, benzodiazepam that we have there is lorazepam. Now, antipsychotics are not recommended in the treatment of alcohol withdrawal. Yeah, so that makes haloperidol a wrong choice. So, same patient. My question to you would be, what is the chronic treatment of choice for his alcohol withdrawal. We want to end up with a lasting solution, not a temporary one. Be a camprosate. Would it be metronidazole? Would it be diazepam? Or would you opt for to lock it in. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose from one of the four. My opinion, A is the correct answer. A composite is indicated for ethanol dependence, but it must be used on conditions that the patient becomes abstinent. Now, diazepam is not indicated for ethanol dependence, but is used in treatment of acute alcohol withdrawal. That makes option C wrong. Now, metronidazole may interfere with the metabolism of ethanol, which would result in disulfiram-like 
reactions uh, that would be a very wrong choice in this case that makes b wrong and uh, yeah patients should avoid ethanol ingestion when they are on metronidazole now duloxetine is not indicated to treat alcohol withdrawal either so that makes d a wrong choice the next question which reads which of the following is or are major risk factors for venous thromboembolism is it surgery cancer or both surgery and cancer or alcohol consumption i'll give you 10 seconds to make the correct pharmacotherapeutic choice in my opinion a and b are both correct so surgery or trauma whether it's major trauma lower extremity injury immobility lower extremity paresis cancer both active and occult cancer therapy be it chemotherapy or hormonal therapy or angiogenesis inhibitor use or radiotherapy venous compression previous vte increasing age pregnancy postpartum period and use of contraceptives can all increase chances of a vt arising so that makes option c the correct one let's move to the next question which reads what is or are the indications for stress ulcer prophylaxis in a patient is it when patients have coagulopathy not related to anticoagulant use or is it the need for mechanical ventilation lasting over 48 hours or is it the use of high dose corticosteroids like uh, anything above 250 milligrams of hydrocortisone per day or its equivalent or is it all the above i'll give you 10 seconds to make a right decision before we move to the answer i just forgot to also mention that uh, erythropoiesis acute medical illness inflammatory bowel disease nephrotic syndrome myeloproliferative disorders um, obesity and uh, the presence of a cvc or inherited or acquired thrombophilia can also increase chances of a vte just for your information now let's move to the uh in my opinion all the above would apply so stress ulcer prophylaxis is indicated in patients with coagulopathy requiring me mechanical ventilation for over 48 hours who have a history of uh, GI ulceration um, or bleeding within one year before the current admission and it's also relevant in patients with at least two of the following an ICU stay for more than a week sepsis use of high dose steroids like in this question which is above 250 milligrams of hydrocortisone or an equivalent or occult bleeding lasting six days or more so that makes answer d correct 
Now, in our next question, I would like to cheer up the statisticians in the house. In a study where rivaroxaban was compared to enoxaparin to find the total VTE following total hip replacement surgery, there were, pay attention, 17 total VTEs out of 1,513 patients in the rivaroxaban group and a total of 57 out of 1473 in the enoxaparin group so my question to you is how many patients would you need to treat with rivaroxaban rather than enoxaparin to prevent one incident or event of vte would it be 27 63 36 or 72 i'll give you time to compute I'll give you 10 seconds precisely to compute before showing you the correct answer in my opinion so the correct answer according to that quick arithmetic is C. So I'll give you another five seconds to look at how I reached that answer. In case you need to revisit it, I would encourage you to review this video. So let's move to the next question. So J O Z is a 66 year old male patient who comes to the clinic complaining of excessive thirst and urination which has lasted over 30 days his past medical history includes hypertension and dyspepsia sorry and uh, he has been on amlodipine five milligrams taken orally once a day alongside famotidine 20 milligrams orally bd to manage his dyspepsia he is a five eight five feet eight inches tall patient who weighs 180 pounds now the poc plasma glucose test uh, shows his levels are 224 milligrams per deciliter his two average blood pressure readings are 124 systolic 78 diastolic so at this stage which of the following statements is true about this patient and his diagnosis of type 2 diabetes mellitus is it his A1C must be above 6.5 to diagnose him of type 2 diabetes at this moment or is it 2 hour plasma glucose of equal to or above 200 milligrams per deciliter after administering 75 grams orally must be done to diagnose him type 2 diabetic or should it be fasting plasma glucose equal to or above 126 must be obtained for a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes or should can we conclude that JM already has a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes based on his random plasma glucose of above 200 and the presence of diabetes mellitus symptoms i'll give you 10 seconds to make a decision so the correct answer is d now the his symptoms the excessive fast and urination over the past month plus the random blood glucose which 
is recorded to be above 200 milligrams per deciliter give him a diagnosis of diabetes that makes d correct answers a b and c can in some cases be correct options however they do not fit this specific patient um, according to the AACE and the ACE 2015 guidelines uh, there are clear definitions of possible symptoms of diabetes mellitus which include frequent thirst polydipsia frequent urination polyuria and polyphagia which is extreme hunger that they've not mentioned here there can also be blood vision weakness and unexplained weight loss just for your information so let's move to the next question reads which of the following statements regarding piperacillin tazobactam and ampicillin sulbactam are true is it piperacillin tazobactam covers acinetobacter baumani while ampicillin sulbactam does not or is it piperacillin tazobactam covers ESBLs while ampicillin sulbactam has no cover for expanded, extended spectrum beta lactamases or is it that piperacillin tazobactam covers pseudomonas aeruginosa while uh, ampicillin sulbactam covers acinetobacter baumani or is it that neither of the two covers anaerobic bacteria i'll give you 10 seconds to make a rational therapeutic decision so in my opinion the correct answer is c Piperacillin tazobactam actually covers Pseudomonas aeruginosa unless they are MDROs with very high MICs. And uh, ampicillin sulbactam also does have acinetobacter baumani cover unless it's an MDRO. Now, answer A is wrong because we know that ampicillin sulbactam does cover acinetobacter baumani while piperacillin tazobactam covers acinetobacter uh, does not or it has variable coverage of acinetobacter baumani uh, b is also wrong because neither of the two covers extended spectrum beta lactamases now d is also wrong because both piperacillin tazobactam and ampicillin sulbactam have broad anaerobic coverage so let's move to the next question a patient comes to you with urosepsis with risk factors for extended spectrum telactamesis. So my question to you is, what is the best option to start as your empiric IV antibiotic therapy? Would it be a tapenem? Would you opt for piperacillin tazobactam 4.5 grams infused over four hours every six hours? Or would you infuse 2 grams of ceftriaxone diluted in 100 ml of normal saline infused over half an hour? Or would you opt for ampicillin sulbactam? I'll give you 10 seconds to make the correct pharmacotherapeutic choice. So in my opinion, A is the correct answer. 
etapenem would be the drug of choice for extended spectrum beta lactamase empirical treatment due to the fact that there is a high degree of sensitivity to it now you can then later on de-escalate once you have culture and sensitivity results now inherently extended spectrum beta lactamases tend to resist third generation cephalosporins like triaxone and penicillins which include piperacillin tazobactam and ampicillin sulbactam that makes choices b c and d inappropriate from an ams point of view let's move to the next question now a patient receiving piperacillin tazobactam for complicated urinary tract infection is reported to be allergic to sulfur compounds and to a fluoroquinolone moxifloxacin so what would be the most appropriate agent for de-escalation based on the culture and sensitivity report displayed there so i'll give you five seconds to look at that lab report So would you go for 2 grams of cefepine diluted in 50 ml normosilin and infused over half an hour? Would you continue giving your patient piperacillin tazobactam? Would you switch to 400 mg of ciprofloxacin infused over an hour? Or would you administer 1 to 2 grams of meropenem diluted in 100 ml of saline and infused over 3 hours administered thrice daily. I'll give you 10 seconds to make a rational decision. So in my opinion, I would settle for cefepime. Now cefepime has narrower coverage than piperacillin tazobactam. And from the culture and sensitivity report that we saw, the bugs are sensitive to both. To cef so I'll, I would settle for cefepime. And uh, from an AMS perspective, I would preserve both piperacillin tazobactam and meropenem that have broad spectrum. Now we were told earlier that the patient was allergic to moxifloxacin. So I would not risk administering another fluoroquinolone. That makes choice C of infusing 400 milligrams of ciprofloxacin a uh, wrong choice you would endanger the patient's life unnecessarily so let's move to the next question which reads which of the following are risk factors for clostridioides infection is it advanced age or previous antimicrobial usage or is it use of acid suppressing medications or do all the three options above apply i'll give you 10 seconds to make a decision in my opinion the correct answer is all the above now we know that advanced age 
previous antimicrobial usage, uh, prolonged duration of hospitalization, cancer chemotherapy, GI surgery, tube feeding, and usage of uh, PPIs or H2 blockers to suppress acid are uh, among risk factors for C. diff associated diarrhea in our patients. So among the notorious antimicrobials that I would look out for are clindamycin, the fluoroquinolones, third and fourth generation cephalosporins, and carbapenems. If a patient had received those prior, there would be high chances of coming down with C. diff associated diarrhea. So let's move to the next question. So something for the statisticians. So there's a table there. And uh, the question says, above are results of a study that looked at mortality after an antiarrhythmic drug, donadoron therapy for severe heart failure. Given the data above, what is the absolute risk of cardiovascular death with dronadoron group in severe heart failure patients? Is it 0 0.033? Is it 0 0.077? It is, is it 0 0.13 or is it 0 0.77? I'll give you 10 seconds to do the quick arithmetic. I know you are sharp statisticians. So the correct answer is B. And here is how it was computed. So I'll give you another five seconds to go through. In case you want to digest it further, I would advise you to rewatch this video from my YouTube channel. question still applies to the same trial but in this case my question to you is what is the absolute risk of cardiovascular death using dronadoron therapy compared to placebo is it 2.7 1.7 or 98.3 I'll give you 10 seconds to you do your quick arithmetic. So the correct answer is A. That is how it's computed. So I'll give you another five seconds in case you want to dig deeper. You can rewatch this video. So the same case this time. What is the absolute risk for cardiovascular death in the placebo group in severe? heart failure patients. Is it 0 0.077? Is it 0 0.082? Is it 0 0.028? Or is it 0 0.033? You have 10 seconds to make a decision. So in my opinion, the correct answer is C. That is the computation.
So in the next question, what is the relative risk increase using dronedaron compared to placebo in severe heart failure patients? Is it 170%? Is it 30%? Is it 6.9%? Or is it 4.9%? You have 10 seconds to do your quick arithmetic. So A is the correct answer. That is how we arrived at A. So dear listener, I hope you gleaned a lot from part two of our pharmacotherapy MCQs. And if this video helped you in any way, I would like to urge you to remember to give it a thumbs up. And above all, remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would like to promise you that the best is yet to come. And I thank you for viewing and for listening. I hope to interact with you further in part three of this series so thank you very much i appreciate your partnership and your sacrifice